You may be seated. Well, it's a good thing some people are traveling. Well, Nahum chapter 4. I'm just joking. (laughs) Nahum was intense. How about Psalm 23? So while you're turning there, this morning we're going to start a two-week study on one of the most beloved passages of Scripture, Psalm 23. Uh, Many of you probably know this passage by memory. It's an especially beautiful psalm. It gives us a portrait of God as a loving and caring shepherd. Uh, For this reason, it's very encouraging and and a strengthening portion of Scripture. It's especially helpful for those undergoing trials and tribulation. Matthew Henry, a, a pastor and commentator, said, Many of David's psalms are full of complaints, but this is full of comforts. The expressions of delight in God's great goodness and dependence upon him. It is a psalm which has been sung by good Christians and will be while the world stands with a great deal of pleasure and satisfaction. Pastor Charles Spurgeon said of this of the psalm, There is no din of arms, no noise of war, but there is a delicious hush only broken by the gentle tinkling of the sheep bell. It is a psalm about God's provision and protection of his people. Uh, there's something very unique, though, and strange about this psalm. It's a, a strange passage in that it is one of the few portions of Scripture that seems to be an ever-present feature in modern popular culture. Psalm 23 is quoted in films such as Saving, Saving Private Ryan. We watched that last night. Uh, Titanic, True Grit, and even one of the more recent Terminator movies. So Google tells me. Um, it's referenced in songs by Pink Floyd, U2, the heavy metal band Megadeth, and even in a rap by Jay-Z, which is, he's like old school now. It's weird, right? Jay-Z. Do you kids even know who he is? No? Yep. See? Uh, how many of you been at a funeral where they read uh, the psalm, Psalm 23, right? A bunch of you. Me too. And this psalm, at least in a modern American mindset, has come to be associated primarily with the end of life or tragic events. Uh, so the obvious reason Psalm 23 is so well known uh, is because it's been included in most English-speaking funeral liturgies since the 1920s. Uh, for example, it was also cited in reference to the September 11th terrorist attack in two notable ways. First, Todd Beamer, one of the passengers that helped stop the weaponization of Flight 93, recited the psalm over the, the cell phone before charging the terrorists. Second, President George W. Bush cited the psalm in his address to the nation on the evening of September 11th. Suffice to say, people, Christian and non-Christian alike, are very familiar with this passage. Now, it's also been said that familiarity breeds contempt. And I think this can, in a way, be applied to this wonderful psalm. We're so familiar with it that we have a tendency to not meditate and reflect on it. We almost assume that we get it that we have already squeezed all the juice from this berry. And I don't think that is the case. Uh, Regardless, it's my goal to help you come to this passage with fresh eyes and soft hearts. Many, if not most of the things I'll point out, won't be new ideas for most of you. One of the critiques of uh, Mars Hill was that they came there to hear something new every day, right? Some new idea. You don't come to church to hear some new idea every week. Sometimes you will hear something. But we, we're here for new experiences and old, unchanging truth. So I want to challenge you, though, of the truth in Psalm 23. Uh, are they true of your life? How often is it that our professed beliefs are greatly out of sync with our actual lives? Too often, right? There's things we say we believe. But if we look at our life, it testifies to a whole nother set of beliefs. So this week, we'll consider the sheep's confession of faith found in verse 1. And next week, we'll consider what it means to belong to the sheepfold of the Lord in the rest of the passage. But let's read the entire psalm now. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. 
Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, bless this time in your word. May it convict us, encourage us, strengthen us, and send us out. Lord, trusting you in the ups and downs, mountains and valleys, in the trials and tribulation, in the good times and the bad. May this strengthen us, Lord, to always lean on you, our great shepherd. In your son's name, amen. What does it mean to confess the Lord is my shepherd? This is a river from which the rest of the points in the passage cascade down. And not surprisingly, it's the most overlooked point. Uh, if we are to understand this psalm, we must understand the first five words that are easy to quickly pass over, but they warrant meditation. So I want us to sit on this amazing confession of David's for a moment. Now, it isn't surprising that David explains his relationship with God in pastoral terms. David himself was a shepherd, and he spent many days and nights with a flock of sheep out in the fields. Perhaps you remember the exchange in 1 Samuel 17 between King Saul and David when the king learned that David desired to challenge Goliath the giant. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. God, I love David, right? David knew what it meant to be a shepherd. He knew how needy and vulnerable sheep were. He knew what it meant to risk his life to protect them. And there can be no doubt that this is partially what lies behind the beautiful confession, the Lord is my shepherd. But there's much more to it than that. Psalm 23 is scripture, and scripture comes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God used writers, according to 2 Peter, who were born along by the Holy Spirit. They were part of it, carried along. Well, you say, how could God write it, and it be God's words, and still David write it, and it be David's words? Because God had made David into the man that he wanted him to be. Inspiration is not automatic writing, you know, where a demon takes over and you just write things out. That's not how inspiration works. God formed the personality of David. God ordained that he would be born to Jesse. God controlled the environment David would grow up in. And it was through the providence of God that David was a shepherd. God controlled David's life to make him into the man that he wanted him to be. When David was exactly what God wanted him to be, what God intended him to be, God then directed and controlled the free and willing choice of David so that he wrote down the very words of God. God made David into the man who would think the kind of thoughts that God could use to express his truth. And God literally selected the words of David's own life out of David's own personality, his own words, his own vocabulary, and his own emotions. The words were David's words. But in reality, his whole life had been so framed by God that they were God's words. Listen to David's words in 2 Samuel 23, 2. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word was in my tongue. He says it was me and it was my tongue, but came out, what came out was the word of God. Now, this is what makes scripture so amazing. God inspires different men from different cultures, from different times to write down his word. So scripture is in one sense, or in one sense has many authors. But in truth, the real author, the one who breathes it out is God. And that is why there's such a profound unity to scripture. I studied philosophy and religion in uh, college, and everyone would say, oh, all the holy books are the same. No, they're not. Anyone that says that, you say, you haven't read them, have you? Right? I can tell. Scripture is in an incredible unity. The Megvedas are... Uh, the Quran. Have you ever read the Quran? It's insane. It is dumb. It is foolish. It deserves no respect, right? It contradicts itself throughout the whole thing because he was just kind of working it out as he went. One fever dream to another fever dream. Um, but scripture, 40 authors, 66 books, and it somehow all makes sense. Why? Because it's the work of God. There isn't one word, one thought, one jot, one tittle, except those which God intended to be there. It's divine. 
everything that is in there is in there for a reason, which brings me back to Psalm 23. It is true that God used David's experience to bring about the words of our passage, but the sheep and shepherd theme doesn't only appear here in Psalm 23. Rather, it is a constant unifying theme that shows up in both the Old and New Testament. God is often referred to as a shepherd. Genesis 48, 15 says, he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who's been my shepherd all my life to this day. Psalm 80, verse one, oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. Psalm 100, verse three, know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people in the sheep of his pasture. Also, God often refers to his appointed leaders, both good and bad, as shepherds. Jeremiah 3.15, Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart, who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. Ezekiel 34.2, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? And lastly, 1 Peter 5.2, Peter urges the elders to shepherd the flock of God among you. That's why we refer to elders as pastors. Elders, the office, pastor, that is shepherding, is the function. Think of how many of God's chosen leaders are shepherds. Righteous Abel was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. This is by providence, not by accident. Also, throughout scripture, man is referred to as sheep in a need of a shepherd. Numbers 27, 17. Who will go out and come in before them? Who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord will not be like sheep which have no shepherd? First Kings twenty two seventeen. So he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. Matthew nine thirty six. Seeing the people, Jesus felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And lastly, first Peter two twenty five. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you've returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Time and time again, the theme comes up in scripture. It comes up because God loves us, because he knows we are dense. We are stupid. He knows that we need similes and metaphors and illustrations to even just begin to understand one billionth of one percent of his truth. And shepherd and sheep is something we can understand. It's a picture that makes sense. Now, you may notice that I, I skipped the most obvious and perhaps the most important example of shepherd and sheep or the shepherd and sheep theme in Scripture. John 10. I've done it on purpose. I've done it because all the mentions of shepherd and sheep all point and in a way find their ultimate fulfillment in John 10, 11 through 18. Listen to the words of our Lord. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I might take it again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. What a beautiful passage. What a wonderful savior and shepherd we have in Christ. Now, Psalm 23 can only fully be understood in the context of John 10. And I know that might sound weird to some. There are nearly a thousand years between the writing of Psalm 23 and the incarnation of Christ. How is it then that John 10 is necessary to fully understand Psalm 23? Well, listen to the words of 1 Peter 10 through 12. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesy of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. 
It was revealed to them that they are not serving themselves, but you. And these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. Do you remember the conversation that Christ had with the two men on the road uh, to Emmaus? They were sad because of the death of Jesus. And Christ confronted them. and He he rebuked them. There's a a gentle Jesus again. Right. Everything's okay. And he actually rebukes them. He said to them, oh, foolish men. Slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. David didn't understand the full significance of what he was writing. But we have been blessed to be born after the first coming of Christ. We have the benefit of a complete enclosed canon. We have access to all the books of scripture. And since the Bible has one author, we can read a single passage of scripture in light of the entirety of scripture. Not only does it make sense, it's illuminating when we do this. This is what's called the analogy of faith. The analogy of faith is reformed interpretive principle, which states, since all scripture is perfectly united with no essential contradictions, Therefore, every proposed interpretation of any passage must be compared with what the other parts of the Bible teach. In other words, the faith or body of doctrine, which scripture as a whole proclaim, will not be contradicted in any way by any passage. Moreover, each part of scripture complements the other parts. So you can't build up like a stack of verses and ignore another one. Like when I became... Uh, reformed, it was just like, what do I do with Ephesians uh, and Romans 9? That was, I, I just didn't want to talk about it. I was like, I don't know, this seems, this can't be true. That means everyone's firewood. And what about evangel? All, all the things people say. But then it's like very simple. Is God's word God's word or is it not? Is it like, um, is our highlighter a black marker? We just highlight the things we don't like. No, no, they all work together. And that's why. John 10 can shed much light on what we're supposed to do with Psalm 23. That's why we've spent so much time tracing the shepherd and sheep theme uh, through scripture this morning. And this is also why you should have a systematic reading plan to the Bible. There is not one right way. It can be straight through. You can use uh, McShane's is a really good one. Uh, There's a ton of them. The women are doing the same page summer. But just... Work your way through the Bible in a a way that makes sense. You you don't just wake up today and do Bible roulette. You know, people always talk about like, Lord, lead me by Bible roulette. And they turn to the page uh, where it said, and Judas went and hung himself. Right. You don't want to. That's not how we read the Bible. You want to read it in a way that makes sense. So find one. And it's also why you should read commentaries and systematic theologies. Right. All systematic theology is doing is taking the concepts that we find in Scripture and showing what the whole of Scripture says on it. Right. It's systematizing it. And that might sound uh, intimidating, but just tell me where you're at and I can recommend something that will build you up and encourage you. Uh, There are systematic theologies that aren't dry and dusty, ones that actually make your heart stronger. Right. Make you want to live your faith out more. We should know the word of God. A lot of the things I, a lot of the mistakes I see in the church right now, most of them are is basic reading comprehension, to be honest. Like, we are not a well-educated people in this country. Uh, but a lot of them is just folks don't know the Bible, right? They just don't know the Bible. And like, <laughs> should I even say this? Well, I engaged with a flat earther the other day because I was just kind of curious, you know, like, I, I, I can't ever tell if it's just one big massive troll or not. But anyway, I wanted to see what he would say. Like, well, there's no way to prove the earth is flat. Well, actually, or round. It's really easy. Two towers at the same height. You put them on a different, like, at the same time, the shadow points a different direction because the curvature of the earth. Like, or the way the stars move, right? The stars move in a, like this at the top of the pole because you're at the top of the globe. You move down here, they move a different direction. And you go back down, they're going in circles again. Like, no, it's everyone knows this. Everyone's known it for a long time, but the Bible doesn't say it. So you, I walked through some passages, you know, and then, well, well, you know, I don't think that means what it says. You haven't read. You don't know what you're talking about. 
Like scripture teaches it. People fall into like crazy ideas just because they don't read the Bible and they and they get some really strange ideas because they don't benefit from the teaching of others. So get into the word so you can benefit from it and then benefit from some good commentaries on it for men who have been studying it uh, and have proven the test of time. Right. I like to read people that have been dead for a while. Right. Because we have a chance to know. A little bit about their lives and, and their research. Now, anyway, now that we have a basic understanding of this theme, uh, let's look at the, its particular fulfillment in John 10. Or, excuse me, uh, let's ask what it means to confess the Lord is my shepherd. So let's just go piece by piece. First, the Lord. David says, the Lord. Who is his shepherd? The Lord. Bob Dylan said, everyone's going to serve somebody. Everyone's religious. No one's neutral. That's the myth. Everyone has a God or, as in most cases, an entire pantheon of gods. Everyone bows the knee to someone. That's why we have the first two commandments of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, right? Listen to Exodus uh, 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the father, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandment. Israel had served so many false gods, Moloch, Ashtaroth, Baal, the animal deities of Egypt, to name a few. And we are no different than the Jews and the Greeks. We still have a pantheon of God, pleasure, success, profit margin, status, wokeness, science. We pursue and worship these things as if they can deliver us. I should also add probably the biggest God right now. Right. The biggest God right now in America is the nanny state, the government that's going to save us from everything. Right. Boy, that's a God that's going to let everybody down and put them in chains. But there are all these false gods um, and we act as if they are shepherds that can guide us through life to green pastures and still waters. But they can't. They make promises that they never keep. There is only one shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. All others are figments of our imagination or hirelings or wolves. They have no concern for the sheep except to make them into a meal, to use them. David has one shepherd. He had one God, the Lord. There is no other for him because there is no other. Think about that. Think how wondrous it is that David has the Lord as his shepherd. God is a spirit that's infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. He's far above us. So transcendent, he is perfect in wisdom, power, Holiness, goodness, truth, and justice. He has no sin. We are small and so wicked, so lost, and yet we can be his sheep. He can be our shepherd. It's amazing. In Psalm 8, David says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him, that the one and true God thinks of us? That he would send his son to save us, to lay his life down and to be our shepherd. That is incredible. It's wonderful. Unlike all the false gods of this world, the Lord has real power. Listen to Psalm 115. But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold. The work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. So cast down your powerless idols. Serve the Lord. Praise God for his mercy that he has made a way for us to serve him. The Lord is is this is the present tense not was not will be not sometimes the lord is david's shepherd the good shepherd is always with his sheep he is always caring for them he's always providing and uh, protecting them hebrews 4 therefore since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens jesus the son of god 
Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so we may receive mercy and find grace in, uh, to help in a time of need. We have constant access to the good shepherd. Jesus himself said, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And he also said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. The Lord is our shepherd. He is a present help, a present guide and a present protector. The Lord is my David doesn't say the Lord is our shepherd, even though the Lord is the shepherd of Israel. He says the Lord is my shepherd. This brings me back to the idea that, that this a popular, why this is a popular text in society. Non-believers are cool with it because it's uplifting and comforting. They think it applies to them, but it doesn't. The Lord isn't everyone's shepherd. Some people are goats. Some are wolves. Not just anyone can say the Lord is my shepherd. To make David's confession in Psalm 23, you must believe in Psalm 22. There is a reason for the canonical order of the Psalms. Psalm 22, of course, is a messianic psalm. It is all about the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. Christ quoted the psalm on the cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22 speaks of Jesus' suffering on the cross, his hands and his feet being pierced, the mocking of the Jews and the pagans, the displeasure of God. The cross, of course, is the center of the gospel. And before you can get to the sweet shepherd's psalm, you must pass through the suffering psalm. Jesus in John 10 connects Psalm 22 and Psalm 23. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Christ is a good shepherd, Psalm 23 And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Psalm 22. Elsewhere in John 10, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The only way to the green pastures of the good shepherd is to enter through the door drenched with the blood of the lamb. Jesus says, I am the way. Peter says, there is no other name. This psalm is for believers, not Jay-Z. It's for the blood drench. It applies to no others. Spurgeon says a sheep is an object, a property, not a wild animal. Its owner sets great store by it, and frequently it is bought with a great price. We have been purchased. You want the Lord as your shepherd? Praise the Lord. Repent and believe the gospel. If you already believe the gospel, praise him. Praise him for making a way. Praise him for laying down his life. Praise him for the blood that redeems us. The Lord is my shepherd. To say the Lord is my shepherd is to confess that you are sheep. And sheep can be foolish. They wander. They get lost. They go astray. Sheep are vulnerable. They have no means to protect themselves. Wolves can easily tear them to pieces. Do you see yourself as a sheep? Or are you self-sufficient? Then you are a goat. Only wild goats don't need a shepherd. Matthew 25. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, Then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You need a shepherd. David needed a shepherd, right? But you need a good shepherd. And we have one in Christ. Jesus is... uh, the good shepherd, but he also was the lamb of God. And this gives us confidence in this difficult, trying world. Peter says, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold uh, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he has appeared in these last times For the sake of you. In the green pastures, by the still waters, on the mountaintops, in the dark valleys, in the presence of our enemies, the Lord is our shepherd. Today, I was thinking about this this morning about, oh, just uh, August 1st is a weird day for us. So nine years ago, Nicaea died, which is our first daughter. But also two years ago, we moved back to Cincinnati. 
And uh, in many ways, we're living our dream. I'm married to the woman I want to be married to. I have the children I want. I'm in a, a growing church with people I love and benefit from. Uh, so it's, these two days kind of symbolize, for me, mountaintops and valleys. And we are all going to have those, right? You're all going to die. And everyone you love is going to die, right? Our world hides this from us. We put our old people in old homes far from us. No one likes to go to hospitals, or at least I don't. Smell of death, right? We get sick. You get the sense we're at the end of an empire, right? When you look at what's going on, the things that are happening in the news, uh, things that, uh, you know, cross-dressers, reading to our kids in our public libraries. Hard. Think of 2016 version of you. Right. Try, trying to explain to them what 2021 looks like. And you're literally trying to force people to take an experimental vaccine. Like they're, I would have said, no, that's a conspiracy. That's not going to happen. Right. It's crazy times. It's crazy times. And life's full of those. Um, but when Christ is your good shepherd, whether they're valleys or mountains as a nation or individual, God will keep you. He will keep you and bring you through it all. That is the joy of being a Christian. That is the wonderful power of this confession. He is your shepherd and he will guide and protect and bring you home. He will bring you home. Do not fear. Praise the Lord. 